right. Good evening, everybody. How are you doing? And I hope that you're uh, well. And I, I just want to say thanks for tuning in um, to our first virtual um, town hall meeting. And this is really targeting uh, Brunswick County, but it is available for anyone in the surrounding area. So um, I know we do have some folks that might live in other counties. So I'm really happy and excited that we have Ernest Watts with us and Rocky Patel, and we have two folks over from the National Guard, uh, Brian Hanlon and uh, Joshua Orlin, and uh, we also have Lieutenant Jeff Beck. So um, they will do more introduction and talk more about their programs and uh, give you a little bit more information. So uh, why are we having a town hall meeting? So um, if you could go to the next slide, please. Next slide, please. All right. So what is it that we know? We know that um, what do teen brains and, and experimentation with substances like alcohol, nicotine, and other, um, other substances have to do with teen brains? We know that the brains aren't done until they're 25 years old, and that's the decision-making function that's developed. So the reason that we have these laws, like the 21-year-old law for alcohol purchase and the new one for uh, nicotine purchase or tobacco purchase, is because we're trying to t protect teen brains until they're a little bit more developed. We know that 90% of adults with addictive disorders started using substances before they were age 18. Next slide, please. All right, what else do we know? So our local data shows that alcohol is still the number one drug choice among young people. There is also nicotine, cannabis, and prescriptions that are also used. Next slide, please. Our local data also says, where do they get these drugs? Mostly the number one place is they're unsecured in the home. And this is from the teens themselves. They say if they get them, they get them from the kitchen counter, the nightstand, the refrigerator, somebody's purse, if we're talking about prescriptions or duffel bag. So unsecured in the home is the number one place that teens get them. But they also sometimes ask older adults or relatives to, to give them to them. Sometimes adults share medications thinking that they're being helpful. Sometimes adults share alcohol because they think they're teaching young people to drink even before they're old enough to drink. And then sometimes they ask someone older, they give them money and they ask them to buy this for them. Next slide, please. And this is specific to our local data. Some communities are different, but this is what our local data says. And where and when are they using their substances? The number one place is at their home or a friend's home. And sometimes people think, well, they must be using it at school. But even though there are some, there's some usage there, the number one place that they say that they use is at their home or a friend's home, and that's on the weekends. Some in the evening, but mostly on the weekends is their favorite time. Next slide, please. So what does this mean? It means if you become informed, you can make some local change and also learn some more about where to get additional help if you need it. And so with that said, what we want to do is really let you speak to some of the experts. There is a place um, on, the, on your uh, webinar where you can download documents that have this slide deck. It has additional resources for parents. It has a host of information about what you can do because what we don't want to do is just alarm you about these problems and then not give you any resources to help you be more informed and able to make a difference. And if you think it's just the young males, unfortunately our data shows that females are actually at a very high risk and they're binge drinking a great, a great deal. So 13 to 20 year old females are at very high risk for, for drinking um, and binge drinking at that. So we're not talking about a few sips here, we're talking about getting very, very, very intoxicated. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to our first expert, and that's Ernest Watts. And I'll let you tell more about what you do, and uh, thank you very much for joining us tonight. My name is Ernest Watts. I am Tobacco Control Officer for Region 8. That is the southeastern part of the state. And uh, basically, we work with all forms of uh, tobacco education for all individuals. But today we're gonna to talk about vaping and I don't particularly like to use that term. It's more of a marketing term and kind of soft sells the effects of electronic cigarettes. But as we go to the next slide, uh, 
and we'll uh, actually break down what one of those e-cigarettes looks like. This is a, the uh, basic construction of that. Uh, as you see, you have a cartridge that is a liquid form, usually a, a sweet flavor of some type, and that helps the nicotine dissolved with other chemicals, most likely propylene glycol, which gives it the fruity taste. And you have an atomizer, and the atomizer receives energy from a, a usually a battery, a rechargeable battery in that respect, which heats up the fluid, changes it from a fluid form to uh, a gaseous form that can be inhaled. And most have an LED light, which is, of course, charged by the battery form, the electrical charge of that respect, to mimic a cigarette, lighted up cigarette. As we go to the next slide, we'll see various forms of these cigarettes and some of the older models. Uh, the one in the middle there, the black, that, that's a uh, tank. That's a mod. That's the earliest type. You have e-cigarettes, e, you know, may, all types of forms. As we shall see, camouflage is something that's constantly used in that respect. It's the mod in the middle, actually, we had one that was turned into us by the uh, health department in Duplin County. And in that, we had a 10-year-old which had got it out of her uncle's closet and in the uh, during break time outside she was selling for ten dollars a pop letting other 10 year olds smoke and utilize it in that respect now unfortunately that's something we're seeing fairly common the e-cigarettes e-cigars those are the more the second generation and we're even having it we're, we're a step behind and catching up on the technology which is being used that brings us to our next slide and in that, you'll see, uh, again, the rechargeables, the blue. We have disposable, one-time use, and the tanks and the mods. And again, we're behind on technology. You're going to see camouflage is a constant theme on what's being utilized. Let's go to the next slide. And this is what's called an Uber. And as you see to the far, what would be your right-hand side is where the cartridge goes in. The left side goes into the cell phone. It uses a cell phone battery to heat up the fluid and they actually smoke off of their cell phone. The next slide, as we see newer, newer brands, that's a Soren Air. As you see, it charges off the computer. It looks very flat like a credit card, fits very easily into a person's wallet. Into the top left-hand part is where they smoke. It comes apart. The top part is the cartridge which holds the fluid and the bottom is the battery itself, which heats it up and they smoke off this. Uh, again, not the traditional cigarette form as you can see, and that's what we try to educate folks to see on the lookout, particularly parents and teachers, uh, school personnel, and uh, those who work with youth on a regular basis. Let's go to our next slide, and you'll see uh, another generation. This is the key box, which looks just like a car key fob. And again, kids utilize these. Parents aren't able to pick up on what's being used. Uh, the cartridge goes in the bottom and heat it up again right off the computer itself. The next one is uh, even more surprising. As we go to the next slide, this is a highlighter pipe. And it's actually spelled H-Y-G-H-T. It's to look like a highlighter pen. And you load it, and then basically they smoke the pen itself. The bottom part, as it attaches is where the pod or the fluid is added. And if you think that's surprising, let's go to our next slide and you'll see what's called a paracord pipe. On the lower left side is the nozzle where they smoke. Uh, on the uh, middle part of the right side is where the pod or the fluid goes. So let's, and they can get it in any fashion color they want whatsoever. And again, they put the pot in there, it's preheated, and they're able to smoke off the pipe itself. The only other thing close to this, and it usually, this sells off Amazon like all of these do, is what we got, uh, what's called an e-cigarette hoodie. And traditionally, where the strings of the hoodie goes is a tube. And they basically put, uh, there's a pocket for their e-cigarette, they attach the tube to it, the other end, which we see the cords usually in kids' mouths all the time, they smoke uh, off of the strings of the hoodie itself. So again, camouflage, because this is something they don't want parents to see. They don't want adults around them to see that. Let's bring the next slide up. 
And this is a Lady Q. And again, it's constructed to mimic a cigarette lipstick case. So when a young person asks to go to the bathrooms, can I smoke for a while? I just want to put on my lipstick. They're basically using an e-cigarette. Next slide. And this is a sore and drop. You see, these are non-traditional shapes, not what we usually see in the, the original e-cigarettes that I was showing you. Again, the, the drop has a sleek design. It's uh, fashion-based. They can get whatever color they want whatsoever and looks basically in a small tear-shaped type of color. Let's go to the next slide. And we'll see the Jewel. And this is the apple of e-cigarettes. Uh, Jewel actually sold 25% of their stock for $1.3 billion. It looks like uh, a USB drive. Uh, I know in speaking to the staff over in Duplin County when the, uh, I was talking to the superintendent of schools, and when the middle school kids were turning in their MacBooks at the end of the week, they would roughly find rough anywhere from 75 to 80 of these still hooked up to the computers. And that's the mimic. That's why kids basically are getting away with it. And one of those little pods, which is the top part of the clear area, that's clear of fluid. Uh, one jewel pod has as much nicotine as a pack of cigarettes. So it's more exposure to nicotine. And the danger of that, of course, is the nicotine, as we shall see, the danger of kids. Let's go to our next slide. And this, again, reinforces that. The bottom is the amount, uh, the first puff, the amount of nicotine that you take in. The cigarette is the yellow. The aqua color, it is, you see Juul mimics the amount of nicotine as a cigarette as opposed to most e-cigarettes. The original content of e-cigarettes had less nicotine. They still had nicotine. But Juul, you're going as much as you do a cigarette. So it's the same as smoking a cigarette. Next slide, please. We can go to the next slide. And again, this is 63% of people that use Juul don't even know that it has nicotine in it. And that's that's part of the marketing structure. That's, that's part of trying to let young people think that they're doing something that's entirely safe. Next slide, please. And this is a little difficult to see on the next slide. Uh, this is was a study by, done by New York uh, University. It's kind of difficult to see, but what we really want to show you is that first column, the, the kind of green, the olive colored, that's dependence. Nicotine fosters a higher dependence than heroin, cocaine, alcohol, or caffeine or marijuana. And it's because it activates dopamine in the brain. Dopamine is that pleasure chemical that we all get. But the faster the rush of the dopamine is, the more addictive the nature is. And that's the danger, particularly with, as Deanna told us at the beginning of this uh, town heating, the, uh, the form that young people's, the frontal temple part of the brain is just formulating to age 25. But we're seeing younger and younger use of these cigarettes. Next slide, please. The fluid in that, there are more flavors than there are stars in the sky. There are over almost 8,000 different flavors. And again, this is part of the appeal for kids. They want the funky monkey and the orange sherbet and these different types of flavors. And that's the appeal to kids. You know, someone my age does not want something that's fruity flavored. But that's, that's what brings the kids in. That's the appealing nature. And because it's fruit flavored, and that's because of the purpling glycol in that, which is the same chemical you find in cupcake and cake icing. That sweet flavor appeals to them. That's why they want to go to use. Let's get to our next slide. What's in the aerosol? What are they inhaling? Well, first of all, nicotine. And nicotine is associated with 13 different carcinogens. Then there are ultrafine particles, fine pieces of metal in that respect. Then we get into there's carcinogens and toxins. Because you're dealing with an organic substance, there are chemicals such as embalming fluid to keep the fluid from going bad. Then we have propylene glycol, which is nice for fruity flavors and for icing and cake. But the problem is it is supposed to be ingested, not to be inhaled. 
and it damages the lining of the lung itself and causes respiratory distress and illness in that respect. And then you're going to have ultrafine particles of metal because you're heating up a metal item on a microscopic basis. You're going to get nickel, aluminum, sodium, copper. The entire the 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 body of the e-cigarette itself goes into the lungs and does permanent damage. Let's go to the next slide and talk about secondhand smoke. This is the secondhand aerosol. So it's just not the individual using the e-cigarette, it's the person around them. And they're gonna get nicotine and they're gonna get those ultrafine particles. They're gonna get those carcinogens, the 13 carcinogens that we associate with nicotine and the propylene glycol that affect them and the metal particles. So it's not only the individual using the e-cigarette, it's the individuals around that. We associate visible smoke always with damage with cigarettes and pipes and cigars. But a lot of these are invisible gases. So you don't see the damage. E-cigarettes, a lot of these models were created, the fluid, so we don't see the smoke. and We don't smell the smoke, but you still get the damage. And that brings us to our next slide. And that's the advertisement. It's geared towards that, the exposure that kids, and you see the numbers and the millions of dollars. I mean, we're in a situation where as three years ago, we were worried about the exposure to high school kids. Last year, we were talking about junior high schools. Now it's elementary schools. I told you about the 10th grader. We had a third grader in Robson County that was caught with a jewel. It's the exposure. It's younger and younger kids that are getting access to this. And it's kind of like the same model Deanna talked about. It's, it's because of people around them. It's family members and friends that are supplying them. Let's bring us to the next slide. Use was 11% of high school students in 2017. 2019, 20%, almost 21%. Last year, 2019, we're looking at 25%. One out of every four high school student is using an e-cigarette. 9% in junior high schools last year. And again, we're seeing the use increase in elementary school. It is getting higher and higher. Whereas traditional tobacco use is going down, we're down to the rates of traditional tobacco use of less than 20%, which mimics before World War II. We are skyrocketing with the use of e-cigarettes, particularly among young people because of peer pressure, because they almost have a... There are over 800 videos on YouTube showing kids how to camouflage their use of e-cigarettes in schools. Next slide, please. And again, this damages. It damages the ability of the brain at very early age because of, of a decision, motor function, long-term memory, and this is not an accident that you're seeing fruity flavors and fashionable colors and camouflage devices. It's a marketing stretch stretch because the addictive element of nicotine, if the industry can get kids addicted at age 15 and 16, they're going to have a customer for the next 60 years. This is not marketed for people my age or Lieutenant Beck's age. And because, you know, in a marketing stretcher, they're only going to get 20 or 30 years. If you get a customer addicted to an, this, you've got them hooked up for the next 50 years. And that's what they're aiming towards. That's the element of nicotine. And that brings us to the next slide. And again, the use of other substances in this. Uh, it's very easy to prepare cannabis, liquefy it, put it in these pods, put it in these pipes and use it. Particular ones that don't have any uh, odor to it, don't have any type of smoke. We've had incidents of other things. We had a reported case in Greenville of a high school student who went into convulsions because she had fentanyl in her e-cigarette. I know of a healthcare worker in Craven County where she came home and found her high school senior daughter collapsed because she had a highball. Anything that can be liquefied can be used in this. The majority of cases of people during the vaping injuries, what was called Evoli from last summer to this January, which had a total of almost 3,000 people 
nationwide who were affected with permanent lung damage was individuals that were using uh, cannabis fluid or even CBD oil that they were putting in their e-cigarettes and using and smoking at that time, damaging their lungs permanently. Now, we have seen a reduction in those damaged lungs since January. Uh, the contravirus has kind of taken the precedence over in the healthcare industry, but this is where the damage was done. Because of the camouflage nature, because you can use these in public and there's no smoke and more odor, you're seeing an increased use of illegal drugs and e-cigarettes. Next slide, please. And this, what are our public health concerns? Well, some of them I've talked about already. It's appealing to kids, the youth, and the marketing. They can graduate to harder types of drugs or harder use of cigarettes in that respect. It damages the adolescent brain development. It normalizes smoking. Their use of other drugs, cannabis and other fluids in there, it delays. It is not one of the seven approved methods of cessation approved by the FDA and the CDC. It's exposure to secondhand aerosol to everybody around them, to other young people, their peer groups in that respect. Kids tend to open these types of things. They see the fruity flavors. They see the bottles. They see the vape fluid. They think it's some candy or something sweet, and nicotine poisoning eludes that over a period of time. It has become something that has affected a lot of young people. And with the contravirus, it affects because individuals who vape over a period of time have weakened lungs and are more susceptible to the uh, uh, to the contravirus, to COMD-19, excuse me. So it even weakens individuals, their immune system to make them more vulnerable to the extent. But among young people, you see why we're, we're setting up the alarm. And that's why today I appreciate the opportunity because a lot of parents aren't aware of what's going on. Uh, the cost of most of these are similar to the same cost of a, a video game, or a fashion product in that parents pick them up and you can order any of these things. Any of those e-cigarettes that I showed you earlier are on eBay, they're on Amazon, they're on any of the public uh, marketplaces. Uh, even though we have the raid, the uh, tobacco usage uh, law has gone up to age 21, there are avenues where young people can access these things and it's getting easier and easier each day. Next slide, please. That's the contravirus. And again, this comes from NYU Winthrop Hospital. They're talking about the vulnerability of COVID-19 and individuals who smoke are susceptible to it. Similar to individuals that are extremely young and those over the age of 60, which have chronic diseases. Next slide, please. And that's my information. Uh, anybody today who is uh, logged into this, more than welcome to communicate. If you come up with some questions later on, do not hesitate. Uh, and Deanna, thank you for this opportunity. And of course, I'll I'll hang back for questions later on at the end of everybody else's presentation. All right. So we're very excited to have Lieutenant Jeff back with us, and he's going to share some information of his perspective of what we see, what he sees in uh, in Brunswick County, especially with young people. Good evening, everyone. Um, I am Lieutenant Jeff Beck, as stated, with the Brunswick County Sheriff's Office here in Brunswick County, North Carolina. I've been in law enforcement for going on 20 years now. Uh, during my time in law enforcement, it has been, been spent with, um, I've worked in the school resource division for a year. The majority of my career worked in our vice narcotics unit. I've worked on road patrol, and I'm currently the lieutenant that assists with overseeing the Road Patrol Division, the School Resource Division, and the Marine Patrol Division. Um, here in Brunswick County, as, as some are probably well aware, we have in the past had a opioid problem, but tonight we're gonna be focusing on what we see through youth with alcohol and with cigarettes. Um, as the federal mandate has just came out in December, you know, the federal mandate took the legal age to purchase tobacco, uh, e-cigarettes, uh, chewing tobacco to the age of 21. Majority of that enforcement is actually handled through the North Carolina Alcohol Law Enforcement Agency. Uh, we assist in those investigations 
and we assist in monitoring different types of calls for service that we could receive that would come through for the illegal purchase and or possession of alcohol or tobacco. Um, in speaking with our SROs who deal with our student population on a daily basis, they're telling us that the actual use of tobacco products being smoking cigarettes is on the decline, but the use of the e-cigarette and other type of vaping instruments are on the rise. Um, we've investigated, you know, several cases of possession and folks attempting to sell it throughout the school system. Um, underage drinking, we do enforce the DWI law here in the state of North Carolina. We enforce it on our roadways. We enforce that through traffic patrol. We enforce it through using traffic checking stations and through the Governor's Highway Safety Program by having checkpoints established throughout the county and utilizing the Batmobile, which is a mobile testing facility that also ha houses a magistrate for alcohol screening and for the, um, the, the further prosecution of the DWI arrest. Um, just want to speak some about the penalties of what could be faced if you are charged and prosecuted for the sale or the purchase to an underage person here in North Carolina. Uh, it does include malt beverages and unfortified wines. Um, the law actually includes to give is one of the elements that comes into that law, to purchase to possess or consume. It also includes aiding and abetting. In the aiding and abetting, it actually comes from a person underage aiding and abetting in the possession, and it also comes for a, a person of age. The penalties that could be faced by one who participates in this action is that um, a person under the age of 21 called purchasing, attempting to purchase or possessing alcohol will be charged with a class one misdemeanor here in North Carolina. The sentencing is actually left to a judge's discretion, and if convicted, the Division of Motor Vehicles revokes the person's driver's license. Um, subsections of it, a 19 to 20 year old person caught possessing beer or wine can be charged with a class three misdemeanor found guilty and can be fined up to $200 and lose his or her driving privileges. Um, the first offense of a person convicted of selling or providing alcohol to someone under the age of 21 must pay a $250, uh, a $250 fine and $100 in court costs and 25 hours of community service. Um, it could also cause them to lose any type of ABC permit for a period of two years that they may have. We try to reach out and do head some of this stuff off and prevent it from happening. Uh, we utilize a lot of this through our SROs that Brunswick County currently has SROs in every school in our district. They consist in our elementary schools, our middle schools, and in our high schools. In the elementary school, we start off with doing the GREAT program, which is basically a little different from DARE, where it's not all just drug resistance. It comes into making positive decisions and making positive choices in your life. Um, after that, they go into the middle school programs. Some of our middle schools have their own programs set up inside the school, which consists of the KEYS program, which assists students in making uh, a positive decision. And we also have a cadet program where students can come in the summer as part of a summer camp, and they can join our, um, go through a mock academy, deal with different things that we see. The D.A.R.E. program, I uh, actually misspoke, is still offered, and that is the drug resistance and education, which also goes through the middle school age. Um, the Sheriff's Office, if you ever have any information of anyone that may be selling and or providing or giving under uh, underage subjects, tobacco or alcohol, we do have an anonymous tip line. You can reach that through the internet. You can actually call 910-754-DRUG and leave an anonymous tip on the tip line. Or we also have an app that can be accessed through a smartphone, which you can remain anonymous and submit all your information. We try to do it through education. We try to do it through the resistance training, through the SROs, and for us just being community oriented out in the public and being seen. Um, we see, you know, a lot of the actual possession where folks are, you know, gaining it from, from, 
from their household, from family members, from siblings who are older or peers who are older that they formerly went to school with. Um, North Carolina is, when it comes to underage drinking and driving, it is an implied consent state. Um, that is basically implying that if asked to submit to a breath sample, that you will submit to a breath sample to measure the blood alcohol content in one's breath. Um, if you are have consumed any alcohol and give a positive reading in the state of North Carolina and you're under the age of 21 years old, then that is an implied consent offense and you can be convicted of an implied consent offense, which in the same is very similar to impaired driving if you're over the age of 21. Um, a actual intoxilizer breast screening is not needed. It can be done by a portable breath test unit on the side of the road. Um, it was a NHTSA, um, NHTSA study from 2017 is showing that 26.4% of all fatal crashes in North Carolina involving underage drivers were due to some type of alcohol impairment. Um, in 2017, North Carolina, there were 145 deaths attributed to alcohol, and that added up to about 8,786 years of potential life lost by young adults between the age of 20 and 12 years old in the state of North Carolina. Some additional programs that we have that I believe have been added into the handouts is Brunswick County offers the Brunswick County Sheriff's Office Anchor Initiative. That program is spearheaded by Deputy John Oliver, who works here at the Sheriff's Office. And that is a type of program to go out and offer treatment and assistance to ones who are seeking treatment for addiction. Um, there's several ways that folks can receive referrals to this program. They can do a self-referral. They can do a social media referral or all our road patrol deputies have information and contact information to hand out to people who've had an interaction with an officer that is seeking this, um, this actual information and seeking this program. Uh, we take a very strong stand at the sheriff's office in underage drinking. We take a very strong stand in impaired driving and we do do it through our enforcement measures. That's great. Thank you, Lieutenant Beck. Um, are there, um, we'll have more questions at the end, um, okay. but you can also download his um, information about the Anchor Initiative on the handout section of the webinar. So thank you very much. Um, okay, thank you. I think we. Thank you, Ernest. That was great. It was very informative. So. Um, we now have, moving along, since we've already heard from Lieutenant Beck, um, we are going to move to the National Guard. And we have uh, Staff Sergeant, did I get it right this time, or Hood, and Captain Hamlin, is that correct? That is correct. Hey, good All afternoon, right. good evening, everybody. Um, you can go ahead and move to the next slide. Uh, so I'm Brian Hamlin, this is Josh Orhood, and we are with the North Carolina National Guard Counter Drug Program. So most people might not realize it, but the counter drug program is actually something that's unique to the National Guard, and it's been around since uh, 1989. In fact, every state and territory has a program, although not every program is identical. Uh, they vary from state to state, and it just depends on the priorities of the uh, that the uh, counter drug coordinator wants to uh, push, and then also just what capabilities that state might have available to them. Uh, some states have different units uh, than other states. So with that being said, here in North Carolina, we've been involved uh, with counter drugs since the very beginning, since uh, 1989. Most of our support has been with law enforcement on the interdiction side. So we have a guardsmen and airmen that work directly with law enforcement uh, agencies in their offices, either as analysts, we also have a both a ground and aviation re reconnaissance team. And then we also provide free training to law enforcement through our training division. Uh, and in the past, we have done some stuff in the prevention world. We used to do a program called Drug Demand Reduction, DDR. Started that about in the early 2000s. We worked mostly with youth and schools. And about uh, 2014 was when that program, uh, we, we stopped utilizing that program here in North Carolina. 
and haven't really done much until just within the last year. So within the last year, uh, Josh and myself have kind of stood back up the uh, prevention side uh, through our civil operations. And we've gone out and done more work with the com communities through coalitions. So with that being said, uh, if you can go ahead and advance the next slide, I'll turn it over to Josh and he's going to talk a little bit more specifically about what the civil operations mission is here in North Carolina. Uh, good evening, everybody. <clears throat> like uh, Brian said, my name is Josh Orhood, uh, the other counterpart to our civil operations here. So our, uh, our civil operations mission is, uh, you can read here on the screen, to support community-based organizations as they counter opioids and other drug threats. Uh, CivOps provides unique military skills, strategic planning, decision-making processes, and cross-organization coordination in order to advance community uh, safety and promote community-led efforts to develop and execute drug demand reduction strategies. Now, the question is, what, else, what does that all mean? Uh, what do we have to offer the community-based organizations and the communities themselves? And some of the things that we do to support efforts uh, around the state for all the community-based organizations are uh, coaching. Uh, so something that we do as civil operators for the National Guard is uh, attend uh, an initial training. It's called Phase One, um, and that's where we go through an in-depth week of training on strategic prevention framework, everything from assessment to evaluation. So that way, as we enter these community-based organizations, we can uh, see where they are in their own process and then help apply strategies to whatever step they might be in um, as necessary. Uh, facilitation, so this is a, a, a basic need. Uh, so this can be something as easy as uh, structuring group meetings. Um, you know, the community-based organization world is full of volunteers, and that's the way it should be. Communities should be uh, concerned about what's going on where they live. Uh, but when you get a lot of volunteers together, sometimes uh, there gets to be a little bit of uh, back and forth on how things should go. And that's a place where we can step in and just help provide guidance on some structure on how meetings might uh, occur. And also we have several places around the state where we're happy to get meetings for free for spacing and things of that nature, because we know that uh, in the community based organization world, you know, the money is not always there. So we have a lot of assets we can lean on to try to facilitate things like that. Uh, training. So training is one of the, the things that we probably do best. And that's going to be taking all the strategic prevention framework modeling and just bringing that to coalitions that might just be stood up or coalitions that might need a refresher on what the, uh, the strategic prevention framework model entails and how to make sure that you give the appropriate amount of time to each one of those steps as you work through the, uh, the model itself. And the strategic planning uh, kind of comes from our military side. So there are several things that we do in the military and and we didn't necessarily create them uh the corporate world didn't necessarily create them but there's just a ton of overlap when it comes to planning and so we want to bring some of those uh great planning tools over to the community-based organizations because they have a lot of uh, connected points from the military to the civilian world and how they can best uh, use that intermediaries so this is where um, as Brian said, we used to work solely with law enforcement or very heavily with law enforcement. And we have a lot of those relationships that we can bring to the table for community based organizations. So we have our analysts that work in offices around the state for various federal agencies. Um, and then we also have just a lot of relationships with various agencies all over the state through our other uh, parts of work that we do for our program. Um, so, you know, for example, we're working with uh, another coalition right now in Cumberland County, and I've had students go through our Manta training program that come from the police department and the sheriff's office. So it's very easy for me to reach back out to those individuals and use those established relationships to help bring data from those people or support for the coalition from those people. And just one of those other pieces where we already have a, 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 our hand in that side and we can help out uh, to bring those folks to the table. Uh, so coordination, this is just planning activities. So any part of the planning that needs to be done, uh, I always joke when I go to coalition meetings that we love logistics. Um, it's just something that we do daily in the military. It's just part of our life. Um, so it's really not a, a big deal for us to, to look at something and be able to look at an end uh, point or, or a, an end critique and then come back from that and back plan off of it and figure out how we can go from the start to the end and find successful routes as we partner with the community-based organizations and see what their goals are 
and then how we can kind of uh, insert ourselves there and, and help them along the way. And the last thing uh, is participation. So this is just being a part of that uh, community-based organization. It's, it's just being at the meetings, it's being at things outside of meetings. So if they're uh, hosting a, um, a drug turn-in day uh, for their, uh, their county or for their town, we're happy to come out and, and support that and, and not just support it, but be a volunteer for it and be there to help them in whatever efforts it, it is, whether it's planning or whether it's manual labor. Uh, we're happy to do any of those things. So those are just some, some of the ways um, that, we, that we do support right now. And we're always increasing our capacity as we move forward and, and learning new skills. Um, for example, you know, one of the things that we're working on right now is getting into the mapping side. Uh, there's a lot of awesome mapping programs that the military currently uses um, that we can bring to our community-based organizations. So that's just a small piece of, of something we can bring, such as you know, mapping all the tobacco uh, shops in the town or mapping out uh, areas like per the zip code if you're trying to target a population um, and just helping dial in where those strategies need to be placed. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, there's our contact information. So of course, we'll uh, stay on uh, for any questions towards the end. Uh, but we'll, uh, with that being said, we'll go ahead and turn over to the next speaker. All right. Thank you, Captain Hanlon and uh, Staff Sergeant Laura Hood. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more. We have some questions. At, uh, we'll have questions at the end if people have those. And now, um, so very excited to turn it over to my coworker, Rocky Patel from Coastal Horizons. And she's going to um, give us a little bit more information about Teen Brains and really resources for parents. All right, Rocky. Hey. Thanks, Deanna. Thank you, everybody, for having me here. Good evening. Um, so like Deanna said, my name is Rocky Patel. Um, I've been in the mental health field for 14 years um, and have been working at Coastal Horizons for 10 years now. Um, I'm the substance abuse intensive outpatient supervisor and also the comprehensive outpatient supervisor. So my specialty is substance use and group treatment and group modalities essentially. Um, next slide, please. So I'm not going to get too into the workings of the adolescent brain, but essentially research shows that brain development continues into the 20s. And so we really do know that um, when a teen or a child starts using alcohol or nicotine or any other drugs at such a young age, it is doing um, having such a profound impact, negative impact on their brain. Um, the parts of the brain that process feelings of reward and pain, which are crucial to the drivers of drug use are first matured during childhood development. Um, but what remains and completely developed during the teen years are the prefrontal cortex and its connections to the other brain regions. And so essentially that's for, you know, what we think about with teenagers is, you know, they're responsible for assessing situations, making sound decisions. So as far as decision making, um, managing emotions also, those are things that are still developing, developing in the teenage years. Um, and so there's really a lot that is to be said as far as if a teenager does start using just that overall impact on slowing down some of these brain processes. Um, and there is a lot of research that's been done with that, but just overall that impact of, you know, it's definitely doing some sort of negative impact for sure. And of course, judgment as well. It's that level of peer pressure and them wanting to um, really be able to, um, you know, be in the in crowd. And so they're making some judgment calls that might be um, not so helpful and also engage in high risky behaviors. Uh, next slide, please. Maybe. Um, so by the time that, you know, somebody is a senior, almost 70% of high school students would have tried alcohol um, and half will have taken an illegal drug and nearly 40% would have smoked a cigarette. So just kind of going in line with what Ernest was talking about earlier. Um, and what this slide really shows is just kind of looking at adolescents versus adults and looking at um, the high rates of alcohol use. And as you can see, marijuana use also surpassing adult use. Um, prescription drug use is also really pretty closely related to adult use as well. 
And so when we look at this, we're kind of seeing, okay, this is how, this is what teenagers are choosing to use the most of um, compared to what adults are choosing to use. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is a research study, and this is from NIDA, by the way. Um, and just it's really about following eighth, ninth, and tenth graders across um, research um, in a small town in Michigan, and really kind of finding some more uh, specific drug use patterns. Um, and so, next slide shows as far as alcohol use goes. Um, past year alcohol use, significant long-term use in all grades, um, and we can see where that is as far as from 12th grade, 10th grade, and 8th grade. And so where we're seeing some of that with 8th grade kind of stabilizing there, but also we are seeing a little bit of a decrease with 12th graders, which is um, some great things to, to look into. And then binge drinking as well has also decreased. But, you know, with that being said, what we're also seeing is some of those increases with other illicit drug use. And so that choice and that judgment call of wanting to use other sorts of, um, you know, the, the fancy uh, vapor, you know, vaping um, things that Ernest was talking about and the other illicit drug use, such as opioids also, that have been increasing, and especially in our community. Next slide, please. So as far as signs and symptoms, these are things to look out for. Um, and this is kind of some overall for signs and symptoms of alcohol use. Um, and so bloodshot eyes, slowed or slurred speech, um, sleeping more than usual. And I know a lot of the times teenagers do end up sleeping a lot, but just feeling really sluggish and fatigued oftentimes. Um, de deteriorating physical hygiene, um, failing to show up for school. And so maybe there's a kid who really enjoyed a certain sport and then all of a sudden you see a decrease of interest. Those are things to really look out for. Self-esteem issues, staying in their room all the time, um, or possibly changes in friend group. And I've seen that a lot in counseling in my experience where they have a certain friend group for so many years and then all of a sudden another year comes along and it's been a complete switch over. Um, and a lot of parents often ask me about that is, you know, what's going on there? They're not talking to their best friend that they used to talk to. And so we'll have that conversation about um, potential, you know, alcohol or drug use. Um, mood swings, being argumentative, um, things that are going to increase a little bit more conflict in the home. And so looking out for those things, lying and high risk behaviors, um, stealing, possibly stealing money, stealing um, a credit card or anything like that, just as far as any sort of high risk behaviors, not following through with curfew is of course something that we see. And essentially it's some of that rule breaking as far as signs and symptoms for adolescents. Um, next slide. Barriers to treatment. I thought it was going to be really important to talk about some of these barriers to treatment. Um, and I've heard it a lot in my experience where Oftentimes parents will come in and they'll say, well, isn't, I mean, yeah, my kid got a charge for um, having drugs on school property. And, um, but isn't this kind of what they're supposed to be doing? They're experimenting. Is it really that bad? And so I think it's really important to talk about those barriers to treatment and understanding, you know, what, what's that kind of internal dialogue that a lot of parents are having within themselves? What are those that stigma, sorts of belief systems, attitudinal, readiness for change, financial and structural. It, is it, you know, is the adolescent in denial, but also is the parent in denial? It's, you know, like I said, it's just what kids do. They're supposed to be doing this. Well, or um, I've heard this a couple of times where parents will say, well, at least alcohol is legal. You know, they're not doing any of the other harsher drugs, but at least alcohol is legal. And again, that becomes a major barrier to treatment and understanding what the real problem is. And then just overall family attitudes as well as, you know, um, if, if the parent has grown up in an environment where, you know, marijuana use at 13 years old was okay, when their kid turns 13 also, that becomes normalized in their household. And the same thing also for alcohol use. It's, well, this is what I used to do. What's so wrong with it? And so those belief systems um, through the family. Um, 
And then also some of the other barriers to treatment is what will other people think? What, what are my neighbors going to think? What's this family member going to think if we start going to counseling? And, and sometimes that can sound a little scary at first and until they get to that first session. Um, and then some of those financial barriers. They just didn't know where to go for help. And this is kind of why it's wonderful to have this platform to talk about how we have such great, wonderful options for treatment in our area and, and they're available for folks. Next slide. Treatment for teens. I wanted to talk a little bit about this. Um, treatment for teenagers, just like adults, really, it's it's a holistic approach. It's not just having the teenager in a counseling session. We're looking at um, you know, educational services, medical services, psychiatric services. We're really, you know, the biggest part of adolescent treatment for substance use and mental health is bringing the family in. It is so important to have those family sessions. Um, and then some of these teens as well, it's the collaboration with criminal justice services. You know, some teenagers might be mandated to come to counseling. And so it's that collaboration of all right, well, this is something that you, it's gonna be important for you to do to, to get through some of the legal issues that are going on. And so it's really that holistic approach to, to have everybody involved um, as much as possible um, and as safely as possible, of course, as well for the team to support them. Next slide. Seven challenges. I just wanted to go over just really briefly a few treatment approaches. I really wanted to highlight this one. Though. Seven Challenges is such a great comprehensive counseling program and it really focuses on alcohol and drug use. It's an evidence-based program and it's really designed to increase ready, readiness for change in teenagers. So really trying to motivate them. And it's not just about, okay, just stop using alcohol and drugs or stop using because you got this charge or because your parent might want you to. It's really about empowering them to take over their lives and to really be able to manage their emotions. Um, and the other great part about it too is it can be done in a group therapy environment. And in that group therapy environment, they're with other teens who are dealing with some of the similar issues that they're dealing with. And so it's really being able to promote that self-awareness and also mindfulness for them um, to really understand what their own struggles are, but also um, what has led them to making the choices that they've been making. Um, and again, we have seven challenges available in our area. Next slide, please. These are some behavioral approaches. I'm not gonna go through each one, but essentially it's focusing on cognitive behavioral therapy and it's really focused on um, reinforcing the teen's behavior. So if they went to a counseling session, we wanna be able to reinforce that. And we oftentimes will encourage the parent to reinforce that in the home and really working on changing the way and reframing the way that they're thinking about their drug use and what it does for them. Next slide. Family-based approaches as well. Um, this is another really great part about having the family in sessions and some of it can be really brief. It's not something where treatment has to be forever. It can be really brief, 12 to 16 sessions to address the adolescent's alcohol and drug use. Um, and all of these approaches, of course, um, include the family system. Next slide. Recovery is, and this is something that we oftentimes, you know, I show to the adults that I work with as well, is this is what recovery is. It's again, that biological, social, psychological, and spiritual process here. It's, we're addressing the physical symptoms. We're addressing the medical issues. We're addressing um, the needs of support in the home needs of support in the community, at school, through criminal justice services, um, through any sort of kind of program essentially that they're in. And it's really being able to develop trust in the relationships that the teenager is um, engaging in. And then also the psychological part of um, addressing any sort of trauma that the teenager might have gone through and really being able to walk with the teenager in treatment through their journey and really help them develop positive coping skills. And then the other piece of just that spiritual component of really for them to be able to move towards their values, whatever is important to them, essentially those principles of honesty and integrity and forgiveness 
Um, we're really trying to encourage people to move towards um, really getting that grasp of what is important to you and how can you work towards that versus that old school approach I often say of just stop using because it's bad for you. And so it's really kind of using that um, wraparound approach and an integrated approach to treatment. Next slide. And this is just some information as far as Coastal Horizons and phone numbers and um, our office, office locations are um, in Brunswick, Wilmington and Pender, but we also have other services that are in other counties, for example, intensive in-home. It is a team-based approach where um, we do have clinicians coming into the adolescent home and working with the adolescent and the family system. We do have that across other um, regions as well. We do have Wilmington Health Access for Teens in our Wilmington office. And of course, individual counseling appointments are available. Um, and so those phone numbers are listed in case anyone has any more, um, you know, if they want to get a referral or ask about more services that we're able to provide at Coastal Horizon. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Rocky. And I think you did a really good job of really playing up that teens often use substances for the same reasons that adults do. So in addition to trying to um, act like an adult and do what they think adults do, they also use it because they feel stress about school or about what their future is or about fitting in with their friends. They want to fit in with their friends and because they're, you know, just somebody offers it to them. So they think that's what they're supposed to do. So parents can play a huge role in helping them to to model what's what is what is acceptable behavior and to tell them what the family what the family rules are and just to be very clear when we ask teenagers often um well what do you think your parents would think of uh if you drank at 19 and they often tell us i guess they think that's what i'm supposed to do and so parents play a huge role in really helping to set the limits that's what parents do set the limits set the expectations and then help protect their brains until they're old enough to make those decisions and their brains are old enough to be able to handle the substances that are legal such as um, alcohol if they decide to drink or um, nicotine products if they decide to use them um, of course, uh, with prescriptions, people just think about opioids because it's so much in the news and the the margin for error, the margin for error with opioids is so small um, that it really can be uh, uh, the first time can unfortunately be tragic. However, um, teens often like to use other substances. They use whatever's accessible. So they will use um, stimulants such as Ritalin and other medications that help with ADHD. And they'll also use anti-anxiety medications or things that calm people. So if it's in your home, uh, they think that it must be safe because it came from a doctor. So it's important to keep those medications out of reach. The same thing for monitoring alcohol. It's important to keep it, if you're not going to lock it up, to definitely monitor it and make sure the rules are very clear about this is an off-limit product for you until you're old enough to, to legally use this product. Um, so that is the end of our presentations. And at this point, um, we're going to open it up for questions and people can, um, they can chat, uh, they can write in the question or the chat line if they have questions and um, we'll take those for the panelists. I'll start out with just a couple of questions. Um, since the last I checked, we did not have any questions, um, but if you have some, please do now as a chance to ask those questions, right? I don't see any yet. However, um, since the law has recently changed for Tobacco 21, Ernest, for you, I would like to ask uh, just a couple of questions. If you wanna talk about um, this change and what it means and about the flavors. So particularly um, with the Tobacco 21, there was a change, there was some change with the flavors. Could you tell us just a little bit about that, please? Sure. Uh, January 2nd, um, the FDA passed a law in which pre-packaged pods could only have a menthol or mint flavor. All the other flavors were eliminated. Um, that was aimed towards Juul more than anything else because they were the biggest uh, retailer of the, the prepackaged pods. Now, individuals can still go to uh, retailers and purchase 
any of the flavors, uh, the bottled, the liquid flavors, uh, any of those, those are still available. But uh, primarily, uh, Jewel had four different flavors, and they're down to the mint and the menthol. Menthol was actually created back in the 1920s as a cough suppressant. And in the 60s, the tobacco industry started uh, introducing that in forms of cigarettes and cigars as a way to uh, lessen the harshness on the throat of smoking. And that was the most popular uh, particular pod used by Juul at that time was the menthol. So we have reduced, uh, again, the other three flavors with Juuls. And any prepackaged pods are now illegal. But unfortunately, there's uh, almost 3,000 different flavors that you saw of the liquid forms are still available for individuals to use. And uh, again, retailers uh, uh, cannot sell tobacco products to individuals under the age of 21. But there are ways for young people to go around that, particular uh, online sales. If their parents have an eBay account or uh, an Amazon account, uh, you know, any type of the, those are purchased, the vanilla credit cards, they can go through retailers and purchase in parents' names and, and still get access to uh, uh, e-cigarette products um, and, and the bottled flavors. Uh, that still is accessible doing that. PayPal, if their parents have a PayPal account, they can use that to purchase tobacco products, even though they're in the age of 21. And as you, of course, mentioned at the beginning of this town meeting, uh, access to friends and family members is, is still a way to subvert the Tobacco 21 um, laws. Thank you, Ernest. Um, and Lieutenant Beck, uh, what, what kind of advice could you give um, to parents if, if they are not sure what to do, if their child calls them, um, say, from a party and says, um, you know, they're, I'm just going to spend the night and they're, they're going to drink here and uh, I'll just come home tomorrow. Um, do you have any advice for parents about that, uh, what they can say or do or do you have any from a law enforcement perspective? Well, from my perspective, if if we at the sheriff's office locate anything of that nature, um, there has been changes in the way in which persons under the age of 18 can be charged in the criminal justice system. Um, it's now done through juvenile petition, but even in the past, we would always make contact with a juvenile's parent and let them know what we've come into contact with what's going on at the party to try to make them aware to create awareness with the parent if the parent didn't know um, my advice personally as a parent that i am if i was to receive that phone call then i would you know go and get my child and try to speak with my child and then if you were receiving resistance you know from the minors involved or your child wouldn't give you know all the details or all the locations or you had no way to get there then you can always make an anonymous call to 911 to have law enforcement to go to that residence to do a consensual encounter to make contact to see actually what is going on at that residence and to see who is physically in charge and attempt to locate who is going to be the one who is supplying you know the alcohol the tobacco product the drugs whatever it may be um, you can do that call through a call to 911 uh, you can do that through our, our our tip lines. All that stuff is monitored and all information is received. But if, if it is an emergency type situation, 911 is your fastest avenue. But I would highly recommend if any information like that is being received to go ahead and notify us. That way we can intervene. And, you know, potentially the whole thing we're here for is to prevent any type of injury or to prevent, you know, any loss of life. We would hate to have anyone leave that party and have some type of tragic, uh, you know, tragic automobile accident ha uh, happen after that. Even if a parent was to hear rumor of a large party or a large gathering that may be taking place, let's say on the weekend, they hear their child speaking of it, they may see it through some type of social media post or something of that nature. Please notify us here at the Brunswick County Sheriff's Office and make us aware. Again, there's many anonymous ways to do that. If you wish to remain anonymous, we do not follow up to try to figure out who you are 
you know, we just want the information and we can relay that information back to our SROs. And those deputies have a very tight working, you know, relationship with the students at the school. They know them. They know our deputies on first name basis. They see them every day that they go to school and our deputies are highly involved and interact. They're at the sporting events. They're at the clubs, the extracurricular activities, everything. And those deputies can potentially get a good handle and they can prevent a lot of that stuff from carrying on. Or if it's still going to happen, those deputies do an excellent job of gaining information from other concerned parents or students and passing that on to our divisions so we can go intervene and, pre and prevent things of that nature from happening. All right. Thank you. And there uh, are there social host laws. So if a 21 year old is having a party and a 20 year old comes but there's alcohol there and they have access to it. Can the 21 year old be charged? Yes, yes, it goes under aiding and abetting. Um, the way the North Carolina statute is written, it is written for aiding and abetting. If you're over 21 in the aiding and abetting or if you're under the age of 21. So even let's just say um, if the person is 21 years or older, they can be charged with aiding and abetting by the means in which they got the alcohol and then if the party is hosted by let's say a 20 year old and they're providing the alcohol that subject as well can be charged with an aiding and abetting through the way that North Carolina law is written. Great. Thank you for that information. And our local data and we do get um, we had regional data that was collected by the um, North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services and the regional data was in the Trillium region. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we also had local data that was specific to Brunswick County and it showed that there was an increase in binge drinking and an increase in drinking, especially among high school age youth from from one year to the next. So over a, a three year period, we did see that there was an increase the last year um, in more alcohol use, uh, especially among 12th graders. So thank you for that information. Um, I also have a question for um, for our National Guard representatives. And can you tell us some about, do you do any prevention work with um, service members or their families? You wanna take that? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the short answer is no, but okay. I will give you the positive behind that. Um, so uh, the, the DOD is fortunate enough to, to have their own um, prevention strategies that are implemented in a, a service member specific fashion, as in like on base services. Um, and the reason I say it, it's actually a positive thing is because they are covered by DOD prevention efforts. Our efforts go directly to the communities. So, you know, the National Guard in itself outside of our work is here to serve the citizens of North Carolina. Um, now, that doesn't mean that we won't have interactions with service members um, because we we would treat them as if they are part of any community, um, but we would only interact with them through community based organizations, um, not actually going on a military installation to do prevention efforts. Um, however, I have definitely sat on many coalitions that have military uh, members in their population. Uh -oh. Uh oh. Sorry, um, I don't know what happened. I, we have seen a lot of internet spikes recently. Hopefully, we can get them back in just a minute. Oh, hmm. oh, man, I was right in the if, if while we're waiting for that, let me, uh, since it's local in Brunswick County, let me give a, a recognition to Stephanie Hall, who's the Parents Advisory Chairman at South Brunswick High School. Uh, they did a, a vaping um, town hall for South Brunswick High School back in October 9th of this year. I know the schools are closed, but I know they're working and the school administration of South Brunswick High School is well aware of the danger of e-cigarettes and how it's affecting uh, the high school and the junior high school located right next to South Brunswick. So I did, did want to recognize those efforts locally. Great. Thank you. Um, hopefully we'll be able to get our National Guard partners and our law enforcement partners back. Are you be able to hear us? Can you? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I don't okay. know why. We just lost video for some reason. So. Okay. You just have to share video again. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll see if we can get it figured out. Um, 
but you were saying about uh, your you don't go on the base, but um, yes, you uh, tell so, us about your prevention programs. So, uh, so what I was saying was um, we we do sit on a, a lot of coalitions uh, that are in uh, an area where there's an installation or a large military population, um, and we're we're happy to share our opinions on how you might better connect with those populations of people. Um, but, you know, we've had people ask us directly, like, can you go on the installation? And the answer is no, um, we, we can't. But we are more than happy to share our own experiences um, uh, coming up through the military and what we see as some of the problems that the military population will face. Right. And one of the things that we know that you also are able to provide is support to coalition groups or task force groups that are really trying to mobilize and say, well, what can we do about this problem? So thank you very much for joining us and for um, telling us about your uh, your expertise. Um, thank, and you. Rocky, thank you. And Rocky, I have a question for you. So for parents, um, what if their child is resistant and doesn't want to go to treatment? Are there things, are, are, is there advice that you can give to parents if they say, I'm, I'm, I'm an adult, I can, I can stop? Because we, we have heard stories always of family members who sometimes the first time didn't work. Could you tell us some about like how to encourage um, their family member, their child, or, or how, uh, how recovery works for folks? Sure. Um, I mean, I think a lot of it is just really about open communication. And a lot of it has to kind of stem from a dialogue of, look, let's have a dialogue of honesty. And whatever you share with me, uh, you're not going to get quote unquote, in trouble for, because I think a lot of the times that's what teenagers are scared of. They're, they're scared that if they do tell the truth, if they open up like, oh yeah, I've been drinking, that they're going to get in trouble, they're going to have a consequence. So I think a lot of that is having an open communication dialogue about you're not going to get in trouble, we're just here to support you and help you. And this is something oftentimes that I hear from teenagers is they feel like parents are dictating to them about what they need and they're not being asked, hey, what do you feel like you need? And so that's a really big thing I would wanna encourage to parents is ask, ask your team. Maybe they'll know, maybe they won't, but at least that's a question that can again, increase communication and just to say, hey, what do you feel like you need? You know, you've been telling me that you're drinking. What, what do you need at this point? And, and seeing what the teen has to um, has to say. And then the other piece is it's really about educating and not just teenagers, but parents and families about this is what counseling looks like. It doesn't have to be this scary, shameful thing. It's really just a, a safe space to come into treatment and share, sure with a complete stranger, but to share what you feel like is important. Um, without any sort of, okay, now this is what you have to do next. The other really great part about substance use treatment is when a teenager comes into treatment, they don't necessarily have to have their parent in counseling with them, especially for that first session. A lot of the times what I end up doing is I'll have the family in just for maybe about 10 minutes in the beginning of a session, and then I'll ask the parents to wait in the lobby area um, so that I can then just talk to the teen really candidly. And that then allows that avenue for the teen to, again, be honest and open, or maybe just to ask questions about what treatment is like. Um, and then from there, it's really being able to also provide families with resources. It's, you know, looking at Alcoholics Anonymous meetings or um, meetings for families to attend so that they can also understand their loved one's alcohol use issues um, or drug use issues. And again, it look, it's inviting that family in and really instilling hope in them that there is a way to change. And that's the big thing about therapy is we believe in change, that there's a way to do that. Um, and so those are the kind of the big things that I would encourage parents to start off with is instead of making demands, it's let's just have a conversation and let's set aside time to have a conversation so that also the teen can kind of get mentally prepared as well, instead of it just being sprung on them, that doesn't ever work. Um, and so having say, you know, let's talk about this, give me some time Thursday night and let's sit down and let's really just figure out what you need. Right. I hope that so answered. 
Yes, thank you for that, Rocky. So what I'm hearing is there's a place for consequences, which we heard from um, Lieutenant Beck, but there's but the counseling isn't focusing only on the consequences. It's also focusing on what what are the future possibilities for you if you if you change your behaviors to be healthier so that you have less consequences. Right. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Let's see. Looks like I might have one chat question here. Uh, okay. I think we already took care of that. Great. All right. So if there are no other questions, we'll have just a minute um, to see if any other come in. Are there any other things that any of our panelists would like to add or any other um, last closing remarks you'd like to make? Okay, I've not seen any questions. Um, anything from the National Guard? Would you like to make any closing comments? Um, again, I just want to say uh, thanks for uh, inviting us to be one of your panelists and, and speaking tonight. And uh, I just kind of hope um, those that attended kind of understood that, you know, really when we look at this issue, it's just about trying to limit these risk factors as much as possible. Uh, and then try to find, you know, I would just encourage maybe people out there to try to find uh, alternatives, uh, you know, maybe look at some protective factors. Um, and one of the ones that uh, comes to mind a lot is, you know, you, one of the things that can help, uh, I think, youth through these times are things, um, you know, any type of, anything that's going to promote a positive relationship. And I know uh, a lot of schools have ROTC programs. And that's definitely something I would want to encourage people just to think about. Just because you're in an ROTC program doesn't mean that you're going to be obligated to go into the military. If nothing else, it at least provides somebody with some structure and uh, you know a place where they can build on uh, positive relationships, learn some self-esteem, and, and just kind of have a very structured environment through uh, through this transition period in their life that might help reduce those risk factors that again. Uh, might help prevent them from developing a substance use and abuse disorder later in life. Um, that's about all I'd have to say. And if you have anything else to add, I'm good. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Lieutenant Back, any closing comments for you? Sure. Uh, we here at Brunswick County Sheriff's Office, uh, we really enjoy working with all our partners, everybody listed uh, in this town hall meeting tonight. We appreciate the help that you provide the Sheriff's Office and working as one uniform and unified team in this county to make it a better place. Um, you know, we would like to make sure that everybody involved tonight that's here that's meeting with us utilizes our website is uh, BrunswickSheriff.com or the app on, that you can get through a smart telephone. It lists all the programs we have. It lists all the outreach programs and all the resources that we offer here at the Sheriff's Office. Um, we are, we very much want community participation in our office. Uh, we really like our community to be involved. We like our community to provide us with information. Um, it helps us make this a better county to live in, and it helps to make it a better place to raise our youth that we're dealing with now. Um, yeah, I appreciate your time. I really appreciate the invite. If there's anything that we can do for you here at the Sheriff's Office, please feel free to reach out. Um, normally in the office, 8 to 5, and, you know, I'm in the field some evenings, 4 to midnight, and I'd be happy to help in any way that I can. I thank you again from the Sheriff's Office. Great. Thank you very much. And the Anchor Initiative down, um, a document is also available. You can download that um, on the panel to the right of your screen. Uh, you should be able to download also the, um, the slide deck from this presentation and a survey that we hope that you will take a moment to take, which really just ask questions about how you store your medication. We're collecting data to see if um, the community is thinking more about where they store their medication and how they dispose of their medication. And then there is also, um, I think there's four documents there, so you can download those documents to have. Um, Ernest, anything you would like to add for closing comments or anything, any advice you can give to parents? Well, of course, thank you for the opportunity to speak to everybody today at this town hall. Of course, parents, uh, just don't be afraid to open up a dialogue with, with your kids. That's all adults. That's, that's school personnel. That's 
those in the ministry, those who work with youth organizations and parents, don't be afraid to open a dialogue and speak honestly to your kids about this. And if they're already using, uh, let them be aware of this quit line available. There's programs to help them that the kids don't need to be ashamed that they're using because it is an addiction and they can fight that off. Uh, education is the first step and that goes for the for the teenagers and that goes for the, the adults that are in their lives in that respect. So educate yourself, be aware of what's going on and, and, and know that there are answers, uh, of course, through Coastal Horizons, the quit line to, to beat this addiction. Thank you, Ernest. And on the parent resource form, um, there is one that is a two sided sheet and it has information about how to contact the quit line, which is a free resource. And it has lots and lots of other information, including the statistics. Where do we get the data? So it does cite the sources. Um, we didn't just make it up. We did pull it from our reliable sources. So thank you, Ernest. And Rocky, anything you would like to say to encourage parents or just uh, as final parting advice? Um, just thank you again so much for having me on here. I really appreciate it. Um, and just for parents to know that treatment is available and our doors are open. Um, I don't think I have this on my slide, um, but my phone number, if there needs to be any sort of coordination of treatment referrals um, for anybody who's, who's watching this, um, my direct phone number, it's 910-777-8923. And so if I'm not able to answer your question as far as um, treatment goes. I'll pass it along to um, other coworkers who work a little bit more closely in the um, adolescent world as far as substance use and mental health treatment. Um, we work really closely together at Coastal Horizons, and so um, I'll, I'll figure out a way to get, get your needs met. So thank you again so much, and thank you so much for the panelists. I really appreciate it. I learned a lot of information today. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Rocky. So I just want to say a huge thank you to all of our panelists, and we are going to sign out. I don't see any questions other than what we've already discussed. So thank you very much, everyone. This will be available on the, the host site where you registered. You can go back and view it later if you'd like to do that as well. So thanks again, everyone, and have a good evening. Mm -hmm.